Experts are worried about Japan's population trend. They say nearly half the country's municipalities could see the number of young women fall drastically. Members of a government panel say more young women will move to big cities over the next 25 years. There will be fewer women of childbearing age. Some rural communities may disappear as a result. Panel members project population trends for nearly 900 municipalities. They estimate the number of women in their 20s and 30s could fall by more than half by 2040. The report urges local governments to make it easier for women to raise children. Panel members also propose creating regional centers where young people would like to live. Central and local governments, as well as businesses, should do all they can to deal with the issue. Not much can be done to stop or even slow Japan's population decline, but Masuda says the country should try to prevent too many people from moving to Tokyo. Officials at the U.S. firm that runs a storage site for nuclear waste say it will be three years before it's safe to reopen it. They say they are, they are still trying to find out what caused a radioactive leak at the underground facility in February. The incident occurred 660 meters below the ground in the state of New Mexico. 21 employees on the surface were exposed to radiation. Firm officials told residents a chemical reaction inside a nuclear waste container may have been to blame. They said workers are trying to address the problem so they can resume operations. But they said that will take some time. The repository is a final disposal site for nuclear waste, including soil and equipment contaminated during the production of nuclear weapons. It's been storing waste from U.S. research organizations since 1999. Experts and environmentalists are working every day to figure out how to satisfy the world's energy needs. Some believe the solution may lie in biofuels. Scientists in Japan are refining fuel from aquatic plants, and they've been taking it on a test drive. The driver of this car is trying out a new kind of fuel. He's burning biofuel made from algae. Its scientific name is Botrychoccus. During photosynthesis, it produces hydrocarbons, the principal component of crude oil. When it's refined, Botrychoccus can yield a substance similar to petroleum. Today's car used a mixture of biofuel and petroleum. The driver said it was good. Makoto Watanabe of Tsukuba University is a world expert in algae research. He is leading the study. All drivers said the car ran very smoothly and felt just like one running on regular petroleum. The algae-based biofuel has advantages over fuels made from common plants. Soybeans, corn and sugarcane may produce good fuel, but they are also used to make food, so any increase in demand for them affects food prices. But since algae is not a food source, it won't affect grain prices. There are extra benefits too. For example, an algae crop produces 10 times more oil per square meter than any other plant previously used for biofuel. Watanabe says Japan's geography, a country surrounded by ocean with plentiful rivers and lakes, is ideal for the industrial farming of algae. It's sometimes said that Japan has no natural resources, but we have plenty of water. Many varieties of algae grow in both fresh and seawater, so we should be able to develop a fuel that takes advantage of these conditions. But there are hurdles to overcome. Despite being world leaders in algae research, Japanese industry lags far behind in practical application. At a global conference on algae biofuel, a U.S. Department of Energy representative said his government invests about $30 million in the field every year. Algae has a lot of potential. Um, there's uh, a lot of benefits to algae as a feedstock for biofuels. It's got very high productivity, which can expand upon the United States. Uh, resource potential. U.S. researchers have even been testing the fuel in airplanes. 
I think Japan is lagging behind. In Japan, biofuel research is still considered futuristic. Prodded by advances by other countries, Watanabe has acted. He pushed for the construction of this experimental algae farm. It was finished in March. At 2,800 square meters, it's Japan's biggest plant of its kind. By cultivating large amounts of algae, Watanabe hopes to produce 1.4 tons of biofuel every year. By 2020, biofuel will dominate the market. I want to further my research, so by that time, Japanese industry won't be left behind. As more and more scientists are drawn to the advantages of algae, they're driving developments in alternative People fields. in northeastern Japan are celebrating a new milestone in their recovery from the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The Sandiku Railway was devastated by the disaster. Its operator thought about shutting it down permanently, but locals campaigned to have it repaired. And now it's back on track. <laughs> Workers recently finished repairs on the last two sections of the Sanriku Railway. Members of the public and company officials attended a ceremony on Sunday that marked the first time in more than three years the railway has operated. I could hardly wait for this day. I'm so happy. I hope the railway will continue to serve local communities. The Sanriku Railway runs for over 108 kilometers along the coast of Iwate Prefecture. Local people use the railway to travel from town to town. Tourists like the scenic views of the coast along the route. Local people started asking 100 years ago that a railway be built along the coast. The government finally got around to planning the route. The idea was to have it operated by the state-owned railway company. But the company ran into financial problems. Construction came to a halt. The San Riku Railway eventually began operating as a public-private joint enterprise in 1984. For people in the region, it was a dream come true. But their dream ended when disaster struck on March 11, 2011. The tsunami washed away five and a half kilometers of track. The few sections that were left unharmed became a way out for people evacuating the area. We saw many people walking on the tracks, some without any money. We thought we should run the train, if we could, to help out. So many people were in trouble. Electric power lines were down in the region, but the Sanriku trains are diesel powered and could still run. Workers did their best to repair the tracks. Five days after the disaster, the company started operating some trains that weren't badly damaged. Passengers could travel free of charge. The lack of electricity meant that signals didn't work. Workers used flags to communicate safety instructions in some areas. Railway employees worked hard for close to a year to keep the trains running. They also began fixing damaged sections of the line. Local people petitioned the government to support repairs. Authorities responded by giving subsidies to the company. The tsunami washed away a bridge that used to be here. Railway workers took a long time replacing it with a solid embankment to guard against the effects of another massive wave. Their efforts finally paid off when service resumed on Sunday. Osamu Shimamoto was on duty as an engineer when the earthquake and tsunami struck. The railway chose him to drive the first train to travel the restored line. 
I felt so happy. Everyone was waving their hands, and I couldn't help waving back. I was happy from my heart. Local people were also happy to see their beloved railway up and running again. I was overjoyed. The train blew the horn as it passed. I waited for a long time for this day, and it was worth waiting. Our railway company has close ties with local residents, and that's something we're proud of. We want to continue our efforts, taking pride in this. Although service has resumed, the Sanriku Railway faces serious challenges. Many people have left the region because of the devastation caused by the disaster. And there's still a lot of work to do in rebuilding station buildings and other facilities. <laughs>